our confession then. If we can turn, or if you're following along, uh, I don't know if it goes up on the screen, but Lord's Day 42 at page 557 in the Book of Praise. Uh, the Catechism is summarizing many of the different texts which teach on the commandment, do not steal, do not steal. So Lord's Day 42, it asks, and we confess this together in our hearts, what does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? Uh, God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, but also such wicked schemes and devices as false weights and measures, deceptive merchandising, counterfeit money, and usury. We must not defraud our neighbor in any way, whether by force or by, or by show of right. Uh, in addition... God forbids all greed and all abuse or squandering of his gifts. What does God require of you in this commandment? Uh, I must promote my neighbor's good wherever I can and may, deal with him as I would like others to deal with me, and work faithfully so that I may be able to give to those in need. That's... The Catechism's summary of God's word on the Eighth Commandment. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, when you read through the book of Acts uh, from beginning to end, uh, it, you basically are just seeing what happens when the gospel goes out to different cities and people hear it for the first time. You're following basically the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys and watching mission work happen. And it's a beautiful thing. The gospel, uh, he goes into the Jewish synagogues first in almost every city he goes into uh, and teaches to the original Jews there. And uh, as he does that, the, the Jews will either respond well and they will uh, start believing and following the way, as it's called in Acts 19, or they will start like also happens in Acts 19, becoming obstinate, it says, uh, disagreeing with Paul, and they don't want any part of him, and they react and they try to get rid of him. And then Paul goes to just the general public hall or the marketplace to speak to the regular residents of the cities and see how they respond. And both times, again, there's both positive and negative. Sometimes people... They're taking it in, and they love it, and they follow him, and the word comes with power. Other times, they start reacting the opposite. They get angry. They start shouting. A riot, perhaps, occurs. Now, the reason that we're looking at this particular city that Paul visits is because you see both reactions, first of all, positive, people taking hold of the word, believing in it, becoming baptized. A church begins there. Uh, but there's also the negative they respond uh, with, with, uh, with rioting as well. And really, in both situations, there's evidence of how people respond that relates to how they view possessions and money and how much they care about possessions and money. So when it comes to the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, one of the main things that the Eighth Commandment gets down to is that do not steal really gets at our hearts when it comes to money. Are we, do we want it so much that it becomes an idol in our lives, that we are willing to steal from others to get it? Are we so greedy that we end up wanting things for ourselves rather than things for our neighbor, for others? And money in the New Testament is so often mentioned as one of the maybe most obvious ways to tell whether or not somebody has actually believed in Jesus Christ or not. Uh, Jesus uses money all the time in his parables as, as a way of teaching your relationship with money. And, and if you're still greedy towards it, there's something going wrong in your heart. What you treasure in this life, is a, it, it reveals what's going on in your heart. And you can think of a couple of passages like uh, the passage of Zacchaeus. It's a pretty famous passage where Zacchaeus uh, is a tax collector and he loves money to begin with, but then he sees Jesus, invites Jesus to his house, 
And Jesus at one point says, right after Zacchaeus uh, says, I'm going to start giving my money back to the people I extorted it from. What does Jesus say in response? He says, salvation has come to this house. He knows that once Zacchaeus' heart uh, is no longer for his keeping his money, that true faith has worked in his heart. Or you could just go to the early response in Acts 2 and Acts 4 of believers to the gospel. They immediately start wanting to give their money away, help those in need, support the cause of the early church. And they sell some of their possessions in order to do that. And uh, the one situation uh, with, with Ananias and Sapphira where they come and they pretend that their heart is actually f about giving away, but they're actually holding stuff back. God deals very strongly with them for that fakeness because there's greed going on in their hearts. It all points to how important the Eighth Commandment still is for the church today. And our relationship with money displays very clearly what's going on in our heart. So maybe it's not necessarily that we're obviously or just overtly stealing something, but greed, uh, the abuse or squandering of what God gives us, trying to keep it for ourselves, not use it for other people. These are things that reveal what we truly treasure in our hearts. And so we're going to go through the, the chapter and see ways in which we need to repent of our treasuring issues that we so often still have and turn away from them towards God. We'll see, first of all, the temptation, the negative part, and then also the positive part, the turning, the repentance that is obvious in this passage. So the temptation, for that, we just look at the riot that occurs in the second half of the chapter. You find out about this Demetrius, the silversmith who uh, he loves making silver shrines to Artemis and gets a lot of business out of that. Artemis is a Greek god. The Greeks loved her. Uh, the Ephesians especially loved her. She was the god of the the hunt, the goddess of the hunt, I should say. Um, you would go to her if you wanted to have a successful hunt that year and pray to her. Uh, she was the goddess over wild animals, which would help in the hunt. Um, you would also seek her blessing in if a childbirth was expected soon. She was supposed to be able to bless that as well. Now, Ephesus in particular loved Artemis, and the shrines that they made for her were a reflection of that. It, it's like really every other Greek city in that time period. Each Greek city really had a special god that they focused on that they wanted to please. Athens, maybe that's the least surprising. Athena was the Greek goddess that they worshipped especially. They wanted wisdom from her, and they celebrated wisdom. It's probably why a lot of philosophers came from Athens. Uh, Corinth, which was on the sea, a great harbor, was devoted to Poseidon, the god of the sea. Delphi was devoted to Apollo, the god of the sun. And Ephesus had Artemis. And they were very proud of that, as you can see. Even the legend goes, which gets related here, that a, an image of her fell from heaven, a, a great stone, uh, showing that she loved Ephesus. And so Ephesus builds a temple for her, and they acknowledge her as their special goddess. And on the surface of things, when you see a riot happen between and, and there's people crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You think this is a religious battle going on here. You have Paul with his uh, love for Jesus, and he wants people to believe in Jesus, and he starts claiming, and they even mention it here, that the gods that they make are not gods at all. They're not really gods at all. Uh, verse 26, he says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. That sounds like a claim that they're in the wrong and that they should start joining his religion. And on one level, you would say, yes, that, that's what's going on here. There's a clash of religions. Paul comes in and they're just going to butt heads. He says Jesus is the, the only way, the truth, and the life. You can only come to the Father except uh, only through him. That's going to create fireworks. But you notice there's a couple of details as you go through it that make it clear, it's not just the piety of the Greeks, their love for their Artemis that's at the root of this. Verse 24, 
Demetrius, a silversmith, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there by making these silver shrines. And then even in his argument in verse 25, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. He's worried about his income, his livelihood. This is how they got by. And his love for an income and a livelihood is what this is really about in terms of stirring people up. Now, maybe you could argue that this is a reasonable thing to care about. After all, if you had a small business that you were working on and you were building it over the years and it was getting bigger and bigger, uh, and then somebody else comes into town and just takes out your clients in terms of they take all of your clients on and you lose all your business, you're going to be like, well, what do I do now? I, I need to do something to make sure that I can still provide for my family, to make sure I still have an income. It's not stealing to want to have an income. It's not breaking the Eighth Commandment, is it? Well, the problem is bigger than that. And it comes out in the fact that he, he draws this towards the fact that this is a, a religious thing and he's ignoring the religious claims of Paul. So Paul says, as, as verse 26 uh, reminds us, uh, that gods made by human hands are no gods at all what, what Demetrius should be doing is, is wrestling with that, is working with that in, and trying to make sure that, well, if this is Paul's claim, how do, we, how do we go against that? Can we prove that our gods are really gods? Can we make sure that this is not going to be a problem? Uh, but really, what he's really most upset about, verse 27, is the danger that their trade will lose its good name. He's going to have it so that people are going to look at him and you guys make silver shrines for Artemis? That's not even a god. You're wasting your time. They're not going to be able to uh, use their, their income in any way. You can put it this way. Whether or not what Demetrius is crafting is actually useful and beneficial for people, he doesn't really care. He's looking at the world in a purely materialistic way of what can I get for the things that I'm making. And so the, the, the root temptation here is to look at this world as all there is. And if this is all there is, then get a reasonable job, earning yourself a good amount of money so that you can live this life and enjoy it as much as possible. And that's, that's about as good as you can ask for. So that Demetrius and the other silversmiths they're using Artemis as an excuse to get people riled up, but really they just don't want anything interrupting their lives and their income. Even if they've been proved to be wasting people's time with what they're making. Maybe they could start making silver for something that would honor Paul's God, or uh, maybe they could use their silver to uh, make, uh, make something that would be useful for the poor. Maybe they, they could work in another way, but they don't even go in that direction. They simply want things to remain the same. And I think this is something that we run into, people's attitude towards money in, the, in all around us. We even struggle with it ourselves as Christians. People, we can maybe grow out of the kind of childlike desire. I, I know my, my kids have it where they just, they just want to be the richest person in the world. How cool would it be to be the richest person richest person in the world. But as you grow up, you realize, okay, that's not that likely, not that, uh, not even that helpful. But this, the realization is still, or at least the thought process is still, my priority is to make sure I can enjoy this life as much as I can, because this is all I've got. Maybe I don't have the most money in the world, but I want a, a comfortable amount so that I, and things go well, so I don't have to suffer, so that I can be comfortable get a decent job, maybe I can spend some time with the people I love on the weekends and it'll be good. And you look at your neighbors and you look at uh, people on your street or in your, in your city and isn't this the way so many of us want to live? Uh, just make, make the most we can out of this life in a reasonable way. And again, that wouldn't sound like breaking the Eighth Commandment. You wouldn't accuse people of stealing in that way. And yet when Jesus teaches 
when his gospel reaches into people's hearts, you, you can't help but see a pattern in the way that God's people act with their money in response to what Jesus has done for them. And it's not just get as much money as you can and live this life as comfortably as you can until it's done. No. It comes back to those words on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The, the things of this earth, they don't last. No matter how much money you work on getting, on collecting, no matter how much enjoyment and pleasure you try to have over the years of your life, and the people you try to spend time with, it all doesn't last. It all fades. It all eventually disappears like a puff of smoke. Poof. It's gone. Nobody takes anything with them once they die. The earthly things are limited. And Jesus is teaching instead that we should be living for something greater, for something more worthwhile, for heaven, for eternal things. To work for your silversmith company or for your small business uh, company today and to worry about, about making sure that the things you get now, that they would last and that your business would last and to prioritize your business over all things, that's to forget about what things of value you need to have for eternity and that will last a whole lot longer and you need to prioritize that rather than just keeping your own company at all costs. That's, that's the temptation. It's to get so locked into the things that are on this earth and their value that you lose sight of the bigger picture. Maybe it's the games you play or the, the money you earn or the pleasures you hope to experience. Maybe it's even things that you wouldn't even think are all that bad. Spending time with family, maybe that's really good. But to make that like, well, that's the life worth living. No. The life worth living is a life that has eyes on heaven, that is, that is trying to gather treasures for heaven and work for heaven and work for others to know heaven. And Lord's Day 42 rightly brings it up then that it's not just greed that we should be trying to avoid. It's, it's about living your life for your neighbor's good wherever you can and may. And God gives us many good gifts like money and wealth. And we're just to make sure that we don't abuse them or squander them, as the Lord's Day says, but, but use them for what they were made for, the good of others. As Christians, we can't get sucked into that mentality. We, we want to live for Christ. We want to revel in his grace for us. So we have to watch out that we don't get caught up in all the, the best things that this life still has to offer us. We need to repent of the parts of our heart that still treasure earthly things more than heavenly things and grieve the fact that we're taking parts of this creation and making them more valuable to ourselves and the creator himself. And thankfully, when it comes to repenting and turning from our treasuring of earthly things, uh, we have a vivid example here in Acts 19. So that's our second point, the turning. Uh, the when it comes to true repentance, you, when you want to see true repentance, you want something that shows that there's really deep change going on, right? Uh, I often talk uh, or bring up a passage in Corinthians which speaks about godly grief versus worldly grief. Uh, godly grief leads to change and leads to life, whereas worldly grief is just being sorry because bad things happened, but you're not really wanting to change all that much. Well, we see an example of godly grief in Acts 19, when it comes to these magic books these, and the people that practiced sorcery in verses 18 and 19. Uh, so Acts 19, verse 18, you have, uh, after some miracles happened in the area, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. And at the root of those words in the original, openly confessed, it's, it's like divulging secrets. 
It's like making known things that were hidden before, which is a big thing when it comes to sorcery and the dark arts that were being practiced in Ephesus. Uh, this is witchcraft. This is uh, its own form of religion uh, that happened on the side of the Greek religion in some of the Greek cities. People would practice magic arts. They would try to access the spirit world and try to use that access uh, to twist things for their own benefit to have control over the spiritual world and so make your life worth living by having it benefit you in many different ways. But those things were all hidden. There were hidden spells. There were books that you had that you kept hidden and you could use those, uh, practice that sorcery in behind the scenes. They were the mysteries that people were not allowed to know about. So when they come and they openly confess what they had done, in terms of those books, they're revealing the secrets. And uh, it was a thing that was known that with those books, with sorcery, the, the power of the sorcery was in how much you kept it secret. Those incantations would be more powerful if they were kept in the darkness to openly confess them, that's actually to just like basically give up on the power of these, these magic arts. You're, you're, you're saying, I don't want to have power over the spiritual world anymore. Now that I've divulged them, it's not going to work. But then notice what happens next. Verse 19, a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. That in and of itself would be reason to mention. These people are getting rid of any evidence of what they believed before. It's burned. It's gone. But then look at the extra detail at the end of verse 19. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Those drachmas are very similar to the denarius that gets mentioned in the, uh, in the Gospels. It's a day's wage. A day's wage, okay, that, that's... That's a bit of money. But now you realize 50,000 days of wages. We're dealing with millions of dollars in today's currency. These books, they must have collected them over time and pooled them together over time as very special, almost like collector items can get extremely expensive in our culture. But now they're just burning millions of dollars worth of books and they're doing it publicly, letting that value burn up. Uh, you're almost tempted to say, well, like, if these things are worth so much, why wouldn't you just go and sell them and use that, m those millions of dollars? Think of what mission you could do. Think of what churches you could build, uh, ministries you could support. But that's not what they do. They realize that to sell these books to someone else is to continue the spread of this, these dark arts, to continue allowing people to try to access the spiritual realm, the spiritual forces of the day, and use that for their own benefit. And we don't see that out in the open too much today. Uh, it's much more common in third world countries, but it is still around in some of the, the darker corners of our cities, uh, people meeting together to do these kinds of things. And these new believers want, they just don't want that to continue at all. And this is where the, the life-changing gospel comes in they realize that the kind of material that they have has, in terms of treasure, it has no value for them anymore. There's no value. Jesus Christ was presented to them, and, and with Paul speaking the gospel, and then also the miracles that happen around the giving of the gospel, they see Jesus Christ as way more valuable, a, a way greater treasure that they would never be able to find anywhere else. It's like the parable of the man who finds a treasure in a field and immediately sells everything he has to buy the field. That man is making a calculation that that treasure in the field is worth much more than everything else he has. It's worth getting rid of everything else for. These believers in Ephesus have found that the, the power of the gospel, what Jesus Christ offers them in dying for their sins, in conquering death for them, that's way more worthwhile than trying to to have power over the demonic world. It's way more valuable than anything they can find in this, worth, in this earthly life. That's the point then of Jesus 
calling on people not to store up for themselves earthly treasure. That's the point of the Eighth Commandment, calling us not to be greedy, but use our money wisely for others, for the furtherance of the gospel, for the kingdom of God, for things that will matter when we get to heaven and we'll be able to look back and say, this was done for this point in time. You used your money so that others could hear the gospel. You used your money so that God's work could continue, that the kingdom could spread. That's what becomes your priority, becomes your treasure when the gospel works in your heart, when you've been given a new perspective on life. You change like these Ephesians. The things you treasured before become useless to you maybe even dangerous to you. You can't, you can't help but want to get rid of them because you, you just, they, they could turn you away from God again. They could tempt you again. It's like the true repentance that the Bible talks about that the catechism mentions a couple of Lord's Days earlier in Lord's Day 33, uh, a repentance that requires the dying of the old nature where you just start hating and grieving and, and you just want to flee from that old way of life. That's what the Ephesians are doing with their books. They, they hate them now. They, they want them gone. There's, there's no treasure. Where is their treasure now? It's on heavenly things. That's, that's what they're excited about. They're excited about Paul and his gospel being able to be spread widely. And they want to contribute to that instead. They want to see people confess their sins and start following Jesus Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves, when we listen to the Eighth Commandment, when we reflect on the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. It's not just make sure you don't take things from other people that are theirs. Where's my heart at when it comes to what I treasure, what I love? What are the things that I would be most fearful of burning up and never seeing again? Are they something that, that I just can't get rid of because I'm treasuring them so much in my heart? They're taking my money. They're taking my time. They're taking my priority, my, my thoughts. I keep thinking about those things. I keep wanting those things. What if God is telling you this afternoon that he has a much greater treasure in store for you if you just trust him? that's what heaven is. Maybe we don't realize it often enough. Maybe we don't get excited about it often enough. But a passage like uh, Psalm 16, which speaks of the, the being in the presence of God, Psalm 16 verse uh, 11, right at the end of that psalm, uh, David is the, the psalmist. He says, you make known to me the path of life. You will Fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's what heaven's going to be like. Uh, not only just joy with being with God, but there are eternal pleasures when we are in the presence of God, when we are with him. You won't be able to find a greater place to be. You won't be able to be more satisfied, more filled with uh, with comfort and peace and security than in the presence of God. And these are treasures that don't, you don't just get them for a little bit and then you get bored of them or they wear out or they just don't last. No, heaven lasts. The pleasures, it says, are eternal at God's right hand. They're permanent so their value is infinite. And so, brothers and sisters, we take time to reflect before God, to lay before Him where our hearts are at. So often, this is what Jesus pokes at with His message of salvation. He wants your whole heart. He wants you to treasure Him because He has valued you as more worthwhile than life itself. The reason we treasure Jesus is because he treasured us first. Treasured us so much, saw so much value in us that he was willing to even devalue his own life, to devalue his own glory, 
to empty himself in order to lay down his life so that we could be raised up, so that all earthly joys and pleasures and possessions could start paling in comparison to the joys and pleasures that are in store for us in heaven. We're called then to turn, turn to the greatest treasure, Jesus Christ, and live.